let me tell you what it's like flying a commercial airplane into a war zone. This is Haifa on the ground. That's what you're told to do. You hear the sirens? Iron Dome is around here. But, and that's a very important, very important thing. Once it explodes in the air, remember, pretty much airplanes were coming in from the west, coming in from the west right here, and landing very close to the shore. That hey, what's up, everybody? Truth be said, let me uh, let me tell you what it's like flying a commercial airplane into a war zone. If you've been uh, living under a rock uh, the last year, you probably don't know, but uh, Israel and the Middle East is in a big uh, a big mess right now. And uh, I'm going to be talking about what's going on in Israel. And the so this is a little map that I have over here of uh, Israel, and I'll show it to you. So that's Israel on the west side of Israel. There is uh, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, on the north, north border of Israel, there's uh, Lebanon. And uh, northeast of that is uh, Syria. East of Israel, the border with, uh, between Israel to the east is, uh, is Jordan, pretty much. And there's uh, somewhat of a peace agreement between Jordan and Israel. Down south, there is... Egypt. Now, Egypt has been uh, for quite a while in, uh, I would say, a cold peace with Israel. It's like a, there is a peace agreement, but it's a, it's a cold peace. It's not really warm. Relationships are like no, no war. So no matter where you look around Israel, Israel is surrounded with, uh, I would say, enemies or uh, yeah, not, no friends around Israel. And there's uh, obviously the sea from the west. Now, to some of you that don't really know, Gaza is a small strip right here. I'll show you right down there. Gaza is a strip, uh, and it's a confined area where there's they have their own uh, governance. They have their own, I don't want to say democracy, but they did have elections 20, almost 20 years ago, got their own uh, governance over there, and they had elections, and... A political group, which uh, happens to be a terrorist group, a known terrorist group, a declared terrorist group known as Hamas, they took over and uh, they've been uh, terrorizing the local population within the Gaza Strip, their own Palestinian people, putting a threat onto Israel uh, all these years. All these years, pretty much, uh, they've been uh, shooting rockets, shooting rockets into Israel and mortar, bombs, and any any kind of uh, uh, rockets or uh, artillery that they're able to get, improvised artillery, and over the years their uh, their accuracy of these artilleries have been um, uh, getting really really uh, accurate over the years. And uh, when every once in a while, when it were for their own political reasons or for their own uh, gains, they would uh, shoot rockets into uh, into Israel territory. Going further, uh, initially they were getting uh, very close to, uh, you know, where their uh, their distances were very close. They were hitting Beersheba to the east and a little bit north. But uh, as time went by, they got more uh, sophisticated with their rockets, with their bombs, and they were able to hit further, getting it all the way up to Tel Aviv and into the center uh, of Israel. Now they were shooting uh, just, uh, you know, into the civilian populations, just randomly shooting, trying to hit, hit and kill as many people as possible, just civilians. It's just like literally a terrorist operation of just terrorizing the citizens of Israel. So that was the border with, uh, with Gaza. Uh, from the north, there was another, another terrorist group uh, on the northern border in Lebanon. For about 20 years, uh, at least 20 years, a terrorist group named Hezbollah, and Hezbollah is another terrorist, big terrorist group. As a matter of fact, all the groups I'm gonna be talking about today are a terrorist group that are proxies and uh, terrorist groups that were uh, funded and uh, created by Iran, Iran in the East, and through uh, money, uh, funds, training, and stuff like that, they Iran quietly and actually not quietly, but supporting and building up these terrorist groups to create a, like a strangling force around Israel. Well, Iran has in the last uh, few decades, the aspirations of, uh, or the plan and strategy uh, to cre recreate uh, a Muslim empire 
controlling the Middle East. And one of the first steps of that is pretty much uh, getting uh, rid of Israel as the only Jewish and they say the Zionist uh, entity within the Middle East. So that is their plan uh, through taking control and taking influence in failing uh, countries around the Middle East uh, to, cr to create proxy groups over there, terrorist uh, organizations over there, funding them, training them, infiltrating into the local government as well, and slowly building a ring around Israel of, uh, of military power that when uh, time comes, they'll be able to hit Israel from all, all around with small groups. They're trying to keep, uh, Iran was trying to keep the uh, the war away from them, and that's why they created these uh, terror groups in Lebanon, Hezbollah, in Syria as well, where there's currently for the last uh, 10 or 15 years, there's a civ uh, civil war going on over there. So they uh, Iran was able to get their operatives into there and create a pro-Iran terror organization fighting against Israel. They did that in Syria. They have uh, an organization also in Iraq. Uh, and actually, matter of fact, if quite a few times they've been targeting, they were targeting uh, American uh, army bases, military bases in, in, uh, in Iraq. They have uh, also another, uh, another weak spot is in Yemen, all the way down south in Yemen. They have, uh, again, Yemen, there's also a civil war quite a while. So Iran was able to get through their Shiite Shiite allies to create a group uh, of terrorists where the Houthis they're called and uh, they're funding them and training them. That's another force that is uh, actually currently terrorizing Israel. So for the last, that is the, a small, like a brief of what's uh, what's been going on, you know, or just a background of, of the powers, the power structure uh, going and uh, controlling the whole Middle East area through Iran. And they like to call Iran as if it's the, it's like an octopus and Iran is the head of the octopus. And each one of these proxies is like their tentacles and they're trying to control and take over Israel and the whole Middle East. So about a year ago on October 7th, Hamas, a terrorist group, like uh, I said, that controls uh, Gaza, had a, a surprise attack on Israel. That's it's been what well, they planned it for quite a while, and it was it caught Israel complete surprise. You know, even though Israel is known to have a great, you know, tel intelligence, uh, you know, operation, but they they caught Israel off guard. It was on a on a sacred holiday in Israel, and uh, a lot of operatives, a lot of terrorists came in early in the morning and pretty went on a rampage, a massacre of around 14, 1,400 uh, kids, women, male, elderly, just murdered, killed, raped. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was an insane invasion of Israel. It took about uh, a day and a half for Israel, uh, for the IDF, the Israel Defense Force, to get all the troops down there and take back uh, the territory that uh, that uh, the terrorists uh, were taking over. Anyway, it took quite a while uh, to get things back under control, and that's uh, officially when the war, this current war, started on October seventh. That's pretty much when the war started, and Israel started uh, a big operation of uh, cleaning up uh, what was going on in Gaza, going back in there, and just for the last year they've been going and. Uh, you know, fighting against uh, the rule of Hamas, killing all the terrorists over there. And this has been going on for about a year. The day after the ha uh, Hamas uh, invaded and attacked Israel, the terror group from, uh, from up north, Hezbollah, decided that they're going to also attack Israel in, in solidarity, they, uh, solidarity with uh, Hamas. So they said, as long as Israel is fighting Gaza, they are also going to fight Israel. And then they started shooting uh, the way they do, they shooting their rockets into Israel. So, so that's the background of, uh, of the war that's currently going on. Now, just as an uh, uh, explanation of the, the terror activities that have been going on for the past uh, 10 years, they found that it's pretty, the terrorist groups around Israel found uh, that it was, it was very relatively easy for them to create and build uh, and develop these rockets or mortars that they would shoot, you know, into, uh, 
Israel uh, and to Israel's civilian area, to cities, to kibbutzes, to little settlements, to, you know, to big population areas and, and uh, you know, create a lot of uh, casualties and stuff like that. So over for about 10 years ago, I would say maybe Israeli tech companies were able to develop some kind of a defense system against incoming rockets. Uh, if you haven't heard, it's called the Iron Dome. Now, the, the concept of the Iron Dome, let me explain a little bit. Now, I'm giving you all this background so you can understand how uh, we're able, uh, my airline is able to fly into Israel uh, when this whole area is one uh, war zone. I'll show you a little video over here. The concept, the, before I say that, the concept of, uh, of the Iron Dome is pretty much a system of, of rocket system that is able through a radar to detect incoming hostile activity, incoming mortars, incoming drones, incoming rockets. And while they're flying towards uh, the target in Israel, the radar of uh, the Iron Dome is able to pick up incoming missile to predict where it's going to be uh, falling and then calculate in real time if it's going to be falling on a populated area. If it sees it's going to be falling on a populated area, it triggers a missile from its own system. The Iron Dome itself sends out its own missile that intercepts the incoming missile and they collide, explode in the air, and that way that missile that was coming into Israel explodes in the air and whatever is left of it, it's little pieces of shrapnel just coming, falling down. So the impact, the the, the warhead, uh, yeah, the, the dangerous uh, explosives are blown up in the air and don't uh, blow up on impact on earth, on ground. So let me show you a little video explaining how this, how this uh, system works. Take a look at this. Initially created by Israeli firms Rafael Advanced Defense Systems and Israel Aerospace what Industries, you see over here is the Iron Dome Air Defense UCS System Knight. became operational good, uh, in 2011. During night, it's easy to see. Israel is protected by 10 Iron Dome batteries, consisting of three to four stationary launchers, so you 20 see the radar. That's missiles, the main, and a battlefield the main, uh, radar. These batteries can each defend thing. up to nearly 60 square miles. So, how does it work? Incoming threats like Hamas's barrage of rockets fired at Israel from Gaza are identified by radar. The Iron Dome then fires now a missile to intercept here, these those threats. Those are actually. Prevent... Stop it for a second. You see, those are uh, uh, those are the Iron Dome missiles being shot towards the incoming incoming missiles, and you'll see the explosion once they meet each other and hit. Protecting them from hitting their targets. The technology is so advanced. It can tell which missiles are likely to hit densely populated areas and those that would cause less destruction. It typically only fires at missiles it considers to be dangerous. The military claims it has so, yeah, greater you've than 90 percent success. You've seen incoming missiles, and it's better. You can see it better at night. And once the system, the radar, uh, detects where it's going to fall, the control system tells uh, tells of the. Uh, the, you know, tells the battery uh, to send out missiles if they can predict, if they predict that it's going to be falling on a populated area. And then once they meet up in the uh, midair, they explode and uh, the missile is not as dangerous. But, and that's a very important, very important thing. Once it explodes in the air, remember, there's a lot of shrapnel coming down. So even though uh, the warhead explodes in the air, it doesn't mean danger is over. That means that now there's a lot of shrapnel falling from far up, falling down really low, and that is also a danger. Uh, that is also really dangerous. But that is pretty much the concept how Iron Dome works. So with that uh, concept, that's how Israel was able the last decade pretty much to defend it as much as uh, was possible against uh, the incoming, incoming rockets and incoming mortars that were just randomly being shot into Israel. Think about that. Think about this happening over here in the States. All of a sudden, Mexico, we would be getting rockets just flying in. So the Iron Dome was pretty much was able to stop that. Initially, when uh, Israel was fighting uh, against uh, Gaza, the majority, majority of the incoming uh, fire through rockets was coming in from the south, from, from Gaza. So they, they, uh, wherever they were placing the Iron Dome systems, 
Uh, they placed him in such a place where it was not dangerous for airplanes to be flying in that area. What I'm trying to say is coming in and out of Israel, and I'll show you on the map, uh, coming in and out of Israel was pretty much airplanes were coming in from the west, coming in from the west right here, and landing very close to the shore. That is where the airport is. So when uh, rockets were flying in from Gaza, from the south, and going towards Israel, they placed, uh, Israel placed the Iron Dome batteries, Iron Dome systems in such a place where whenever they would shoot the Iron Dome missiles towards the incoming missiles, it would never go across a flight path of an airplane coming in. Now, uh, lately, the last uh, few weeks, the war with uh, the war up north has become more and more fierce, and there's a lot of a lot of rockets coming in from the north. So what they did is they moved some of the uh, defense Iron Dome defense systems in, and put them in certain places where now they're able to protect from incoming rockets from the north and also from the east because Iran is also sending uh, rockets in from uh, from the east. And they placed, pretty much, they covered Iron Dome systems in such places where there's good protection against incoming rockets and targets and threats coming in from all around, but still are able to keep uh, the incoming and outgoing traffic to Israel relatively uh, safe. So my airline was one of the airlines that, uh, one of very few airlines that kept flying throughout and still flying throughout the, the, uh, the war. And like I said, we have our own procedures where if there's incoming uh, uh, threats uh, from the north or, or from the south and there is a threat that it's going to be coming towards an airplane or towards the uh, routes where airplanes are flying, in real time, we get notification by the control tower to move away and, and stay away and don't not to come near the airport. Now, it, now is it dangerous? Yeah, it, it's, it, it can be dangerous. You know, there's, there's no such thing as no threat. But Israel authorities try to keep and minimize the threat uh, of flying in, den in dangerous uh, periods of time where there's incoming rockets. Obviously, let me show you, even, even staying on the ground is, is pretty hectic. Like once I got into Israel, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite often in Israel flying in and out of there, I had quite a few times where as I was like, you know, on my way to work, on my way, just, you know, resting and stuff like that, and wherever I stay over there, happened to me uh, twice when I was uh, actually traveling in a car and there was a siren and I had to, the car had to stop because once you hear the siren, you have to take shelter for, for, for two reasons. One is uh, if uh, Iron Dome, obviously they want you to take shelter, but Iron Dome is going to uh, go and try to target the uh the incoming uh incoming threat iron dome has a percent uh success rate of like 90 percent. so one out of every 10 uh is not being intercepted and might fall like fall on your head so that's why they want you to take shelter so you hear the siren and now you have to go into a shelter for for like 10 minutes now why 10 minutes 10 minutes is first of all if uh if iron dome is uh unable unable to hit the the, the target the incoming missile or the mortar or whatever then they want you to be in a, in a shelter and uh, you need to wait, uh, you know, till the threat is gone. And the second reason is, okay, let's say the, let's say the Iron Dome was actually able to hit the target. Remember now the target was destroyed up in the air, but there's now shrapnel coming, falling down from thousands of feet away. And it takes, it takes quite a while for that shrapnel to fall down. So they want you to wait for 10 minutes uh, within the, the, you know, the cover you're taking bunker or, Pretty much every house uh, house in Israel have uh, has a safe zone where they where you're supposed to wait. And now, what happens if you're in the middle of the street? So they say, yeah, whatever. If you're in the middle of the street, try to take cover in the nearest uh, bunker or nearest public safety uh, shelter. And it happened to me, as a matter of fact, that I was twice. I was in a, in a taxi actually, and you hear the siren. The taxi stops, and then just you just run. Now, one of the places. Let me show you. One of the places I was there. And there was there was nowhere to hide. So they say, okay, just lay on the ground, and if you can, under a tree or. This is Haifa. On the ground, that's what you're told to do. You hear the sirens? Yeah, I hear them. Iron Dome is 
around here. Hiding underneath the tree. Yep. You hear it in the radio while we're driving in the car, I'm taking a taxi. You hear it? Everybody stops, gets out of the car. Not everybody, whoever, once the Iron Dome hits the rockets, the debris falls on the ground. That's also dangerous. Oh, you can literally see the rockets over there. Yeah, it's east of us a little. Crazy life. Hear the sirens? Gotta wait 10 minutes after the initial siren because the debris from the from the rockets fall. But this dude don't care. Up in the middle. Get back in. can under a tree or whatever any some kind of shelter now why on the ground because they're concerned they're not really concerned if something falls on your head they're actually concerned if a warhead falls near you and then the way it spreads the shrapnel is going to be spreading like that so if you keep low it's just like when you if you some of you were in the military you know when your uh, grenade is thrown at you on you uh, at you you need to, to lay down on the ground be as flat as possible because the the shrapnel the explosion goes this way so if you stayed low on the ground, shrapnel will be above you. So the two cases, uh, one I was like literally saw, saw like, laid on the ground, and you can actually see, I'll show you. And you can actually see uh, the Iron Dome intercepting the rockets, the incoming uh, threats. And then the second time I was, uh, matter of fact, I was, uh, we were able to find a shelter. So we ran into a building and stayed there until uh, the threat was over. Well, you hear this? It's 11 o'clock at night, Haifa. Bunkers. And the third time was actually on, on a train. Now on a train, there's nothing you can do on a train. So what they pretty much tell you to do is, is to close the curtains just in case, uh, you know, uh, it explodes near you and all the glass shatters inside. So you put, you close the shutters so there's no uh, exploding glass or, or, you know, shrapnel of glass and to lay down below the line of, of sight of, of the windows, so. Even in the train. That's crazy. Even in the train. You can see I also did that. Pretty hectic, pretty hectic. Now, it was funny because when the guys, uh, it's not funny, but when I was telling this to the guys, to my friends, they're like, oh, wow, you're such a hero, and like, wow, you're so cool, or whatever, and, and, and tell you the truth, I don't feel that way, because uh, I, I, you just do, you know, you just do what you're used to doing, unfortunately, I'm kind of used to doing that, and it's, to me, it's, it's just the way, I, you know, I, I'm used to it already, so people in Israel, unfortunately, are used to living like that, and it's like, you know, uh, some people down in Florida, when a hurricane hits them and stuff like that, so you look at them and you're like, wow, how you guys do it, you're so brave, you're, and, and I'm sure they don't feel like that. They, to them, it's like, okay, you know, they learn to live with it, they're just used to it. They, they know what to expect, they know where to hide, they know how to deal with it, and then it's over. So uh, that's pretty much how the operation goes on in uh, Israel and uh, flying, in and out of Israel, it might sound, uh, in, it is a war zone, okay? No, uh, very few airlines are currently flying there for the last year. Only one airline, my airline, and another, every once in a while, my, another airline would come in. And it is declared a war zone, so nobody comes in and flies over there. And it might sound, oh, it's so scary, and it's so dangerous. But I can tell you, it maybe it sounds scary, but... Uh, they created these routes and these and this setup where they're able to create a safe a safe zone to fly and minimize the risk of a commercial airline flying in and flying out. 
that's it, guys. I hope this kind of uh, shed some light on what's going on uh, in Israel and in the Middle East. And I'm really hopeful. And I pray for this war to end already and uh, for life to get back to normal. So, yes, that is what it takes to fly into a war zone. Thank you for watching. Peace out. It's all coming our way. It's been intercepted by Iron Dome. That's it. It's coming our way.